Good morning, church family. Yes, yes, happy summer. It's almost over. Now, someone told me earlier they were out front and they heard me yelling when I was preaching. So here's the deal, because I don't yell when I preach. When you hear me yelling, you say amen. Okay, we're going to see how much I yell today. <laughs> so turn in your Bibles, First Samuel, if you didn't get there yet. Um, great job on that, that scripture reading. I appreciated that from you, Lexi. So, and Debbie, it's a miracle she's even here today. She was really, it's, yeah, it, God blessed us to get you to be able to come to church. So, thank you for sharing with us the children's story. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to answer one question. And it has to do with this new series we're starting today called Primacy. And the question we want to ask today is, what is your purpose in life as you sit on a pew, in a church, on a planet that's traveling through space at 66,000 miles an hour? <laughs> First Samuel chapter 17, uh, beginning in verse 25. The men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he is coming up to defy Israel. And it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Before we read verse 26, was David seeking any of these things at that time in his life? No, he wasn't. Verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him, saying, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine? And takes away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Well, we all know who that was today, right? What was his name? Goliath. You got kids and grandkids named Goliath, don't you? None of you? Goliath was human like you and me. He, he had hopes and ambitions. And he'll always be remembered as the loser. Would you agree? Always. He'll be remembered as the loser. And the question is why? What was it about his life that classified him as a loser? Well, it comes down to one simple uh, reality. The word Goliath means exile in Hebrew. Exile. And I think it's safe to say that the choices Goliath made were choices that separated him from the Yahweh, from God of Israel. Because everybody knew the stories of Israel, right? We, we all live in a story of our culture of storytelling. You know everybody heard the story of the Hebrews being brought out of Egypt, parting the Red Sea, Drowning the Egyptian army, the plagues, the miracles, coming into, Israel, into Palestine, the walls of Jericho coming down, all these miracles. They knew about these miracles, but Goliath did not care. When he cursed David, he cursed him by his pagan gods. Well, his opponent was quite different. His name was David, and David... When you look at his story in history, we could say was a success. Yeah, he had failings, but his life was a success because he lived by one reality. If your day was to me be measured, the, the success uh, barometer for your day, if it was measured by this one thing, changes the world. And that is, am I connected to Jesus? Am I connected to Jesus today? You can get to work, but do you get to work with Jesus? You can get the job done at work, but did you do the work in the character of Christ? 
Now, we're all writing a story, and the question is, what narrative are we living? If your best friend was asked, what are you like? What is the core of what you're like? What would your best friend say about you? There was a man in the Bible who was tall, dark, and handsome. <laughs> I was not expecting an amen out of that. Was I yelling? <laughs> and none of us know who it is. Really. I mean, okay, I'll share his name. Tell me if you know who it is. His name is Eliab. Okay, we've got a few. A few. You're going to know who he is when I tell you here in a second. But do you think of, do you, when you hear the word Eliab, do you know who I'm talking about right away? You don't. You don't. But you do know what God said about Eliab. Because in the Bible, this is interesting, Jesus made a statement about Eliab that we all know. And the statement is this, and you, you'll know this statement if you're reading your Bibles at least a chapter a day, five out of seven days a week. <laughs> he, God said about this tall, dark, and handsome man named Eliab, he said, he said this, man looks on the outward appearance but God looks upon the heart. That was in reference to Samuel coming to Jesse and saying, I've come to, to anoint one of your sons is the next king of Israel. And he brings out specimen number one, Eliab. Tall, dark, and handsome. And what does Samuel do? He sees Eliab and he says, surely the, Lord, the anointed is, is standing before the Lord. Wrong answer, Samuel. And that's when God says to Samuel, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. And so he went through all seven sons, and he got to the seventh son, and Samuel's like, no, it's not him either. Do you have anybody else? And he said, okay, well, there is this, my youngest, David. He's out with the sheep. I'll call him in. And David comes back. And here's what's interesting. In Hebrew culture and in the Bible, you don't see a lot of descriptions of what people look like. Because in the Hebrew mindset, who you were was defined by how you behave. Just like we see when we go through the, the checkout counter at Fred Myers, right? All these people, they're all descriptions of their character, right? No, it's more pictures. It's, we're in a culture where uh, beauty worship is really, unfortunately, part of our culture and who you are as a person. Well, but here's what's interesting. David was also described in the Bible as being beautiful. Did you know that? He was, there was two, they both were described. Eliab was described as beautiful. David was described as beautiful. And so here's what's interesting. Eliab's going to make an imprint on the world. There's one place that he is quoted for the whole world to hear what he has to say. He had no idea at the battle with Goliath that he was going to say something that people would read for hundreds of years. Millions and millions of people would read his words. This was his stamp on the world. He's got one shot. He's going to do this. He's going to say something that's going to be impacting to the world. What is it that he's going to say? But we're all inspired by why, what David says. I love verse 26, the, the second half of day, 26. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? But verse 28, here we go. Here's Eliab's only quote in all of the Bible. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David. Now, why is he so angry? Yeah, you're probably jealous now, right? Because Eliab's not going to forget that. He stands up. Samuel says, surely the Lord's anointing is, is, is here. And then, you know, he's, oh, okay, ne wrong, sorry. You have another son, right? And Jesse's like, okay, here's the next one, and then the next one. Finally, it's David. David gets anointed by Samuel Zeres as the dust is flying off of Samuel's feet as he walks away from Bethlehem, 
which is where David was born, that you find then this, this reality of Eliab doing some soul searching. I'm not the man. I was firstborn. Typically, firstborn inherit the spiritual rights and so forth. It's not me, it's David. So I think, I think he's jealous. I think he's angry. And he blows up. So his, his moment to speak to the world and he's angry. Here's what he says. So Eliab's anger burned against David and he said, Why have you come down and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. And that was it. That was Eliab's story for history. That's what he got to say to you and me today. In in an age where he had no idea, Eliab didn't know there was cell phones and cars and satellite dishes and planes and none of that. And yet, here's, here's his message. He's remembered as the bitter brother who tried to discourage David from going out and fighting Goliath. Now, what if David would have listened to his brother? What if he would have been discouraged and decided, oh, you know what? You're right. What am I doing here? Maybe I should be... Should, yeah, I, um, I brought some food for you. Let me get it and then I'll go back. He didn't do that, right? Because why? Because he had a connection with God. He had prioritized his walk with God, and it changed what he did. It showed mission in the way he chose to live his life. He was a man of mission, not for his own glory and honor. He, could, he wasn't there to, all right, the, the giant's out there. It's time to make a name for David, the son of Jesse. He wasn't thinking that at all. He was being judged by his brother, Brother thought he had evil motives for being there. Everybody in this room has an Eliab. Did you know that? Somebody that's trying to discourage you from doing the right thing. We even have our own Eliabs with our own self-talk. Where we're talking ourselves out of doing what God wants us to do. And... It could be your girlfriend, it could be your neighbor, it could be a co-worker, it could be a family member. It's, it's whoever the devil convinces to share something out of your mouth that you've decided you're going to say that's wrong. We see this with Peter when he's with Jesus, and Jesus recognizes the voice right away. What does he say? Peter? No, he doesn't say that, does he? What does he say? Satan, get thee behind me. Get thee behind me. James and John wanted to torture a whole city for de- rejecting Jesus, and he said, what? They, they, you know not what spirit you are of. That's not my plan to torch this city over an apparent uh, slight that they've given to us. When the self-righteous Pharisees were around Jesus, he said to them, you are of your father, the devil. Whoa. Let me say this. The worst father in the world is the devil. If you were unfortunate enough to come up in the resurrection of the damnation, if you're even near Satan, believe me, he's not going to come over and put his arm around you and say, you know what? I'm so sorry this is the way it worked out for you. Yeah, yeah, I know. We really tried to make the best of it, but you know... Now you're, no, he's going to be glad that you're there, burn, you're, that you're going to suffer when he's going to be happy to see you next to him. The wages of sin is death. Do I need to sing it? The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. Yes, there is. So gnashing of teeth, weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is the inheritance of, of those that have Lucifer as their father. And it ends in annihilation. But it's a totally different story for the righteous. David has decided that he's going to choose to fight on the right side. And he says something that's very powerful and meaningful that reflects his primary cause and what he's in this world for. 
we can see this back before I, I say that. Well, it's verse 29. David said, what have I done now? He's talking to who? Who's he talking to? Now we know who this is. Eliab. He's talking to Eliab. And he says to him, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? That's mission. He's thinking divine cause. What is our primary focus in life? James K. Smith, he wrote a book called You Are What You Love. Seems like a pretty fair statement, right? You are what you love. And I heard the illustration from his book from someone last week. I wasn't listening to repeat the story until I got to the end of it, and then I'm like, oh, man, that's good. You ever done that? Or you hear something, you're you're not really thinking to re-say it until you hear it, and then you're like, oh, wow, that was a good story. So I might be wrong on some of the details on this. Um, It is in the book from what I hear. Now, I'm not advocating for aliens, okay? That's the disclaimer here. This is a parable in the book. I don't advocate for aliens, but I will, I'll give you my statement of faith. I believe there are inhabited planets with intelligent beings on them because there's two plus trillion galaxies in the universe and God loves community, so I'm expecting there's some people out there somewhere. Wouldn't you agree? So these These visitors come to earth from another world and they notice as they go city to city that there are these common places that are, they usually have a large atrium and they have high vaulted ceilings and bright lights and calming music. They have calendars for festivities and side rooms, side chapels for devotion and inspiring artwork that lines the walls. And the seekers are welcomed unconditionally to come, and the hope is that they will leave with something. And then in the book, as he tells this parable, these visitors go back to their home, and what you discover is that they are not describing a church. They are describing the shopping mall. And we as humans have created all kinds of idols and things to worship when our all, what we're supposed to be about is so far from what we're doing because we don't understand what our purpose is in life as we live on a planet that's going through space at 66,000 miles an hour. David's primary interest was following God's calling. He heard a giant that was defying God And he said, is there not a cause? Is this not an important matter? See, it's only when we understand our purpose that we step into God's amazing plan for us. Now, it's important to realize that the opportunity to fight Goliath had been there. It wasn't like David showed up the first day Goliath is out there bellowing for somebody to come out and fight him. In fact, if you look at verse 16, and every, El, Eliab had many days to make the decision. So did King Saul. So did David's brothers and every other fighter in this army. But in verse 16, it says, the Philistine came forward morning and evening for how many days? 40 days. This had been going on for 40 days before it was heard by David. God could have raised any of them up to go out and kill the, the giant. The problem was they didn't understand what their mission was, what their purpose was for being on that battlefield. It wasn't about self-preservation. It was about honoring God. Is there not a cause? I met a guy, our whole family did. We went to the big island, and uh, this gentleman was was at this this beach park, and it's called Two-Step. I don't know what, that's the locals call it, Two-Step, I don't know what the actual name of it is, but two-step is a place where you've got two, it's basically two steps. You got this step, and then forget the stairs being here, you got a second step about that same height, and the waves will come up and, 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 and come in, and then that's where you jump off into this beautiful underwater world with all the creatures that aren't afraid of human beings. 
And you look at all these creatures, and it's a beautiful thing. Well, we had uh, about five sets of snorkel gear, and we were missing two. And we discovered from this gentleman that was there that you can't rent it there. But he said, I have a few sets I will loan you. So we sent one of the family members up to get the set. The sets brought them back. We had gear for everyone. We snorkeled for the day, had a phenomenal time. We go back to his house, and now it's time for us to meet this guy, and he's sharing with us what his passions are. I mean, he comes and he shows us the out. He never takes us inside, but he's created like uh, outdoor living with some of the things. He has this pavilion. He's got a pool table. He's got this, the, a couple greenhouse uh, type uh, structures and he plants everything. He's got a green thumb. This guy can grow anything. He's shown us apple, these apple tree, I mean banana trees and these different kinds of plants and I mean I'd seen him, he's grown stuff out of, I didn't think was even possible. As we're looking at this stuff, of course I, I smelled something as we were doing the tour. I was like, all right, he's growing something else too. But um, <laughs> as, as we, were, we were walking through, I got done and I was thinking to myself, when we were leaving, I know what this man is all about. You could just visit him, and, and that, he, it was there. And here's the question. When somebody comes to your house and spends some time with you, do they leave there and know, like, I know what that person is about. Like, it's clear to me what their purpose is on this planet. And if the answer is anything outside of a connectedness with God, we're, we're spinning our wheels. We're, we're writing the story of Eliab. We're writing the story of King Saul. We're writing the story of Goliath. I don't want to be Goliath in the resurrection. Does anybody here want to be Goliath? Or King Saul? And hopefully Eliab got his act together, but I'm not sure I'd want to be him either. How many of you would like to be King David in the resurrection? Hallelujah. Yes. Absolutely. David will always be defined in Acts. I don't know if you're taking notes. It's Acts. I, I, can't, I don't want to bury through it to find it. Uh, but it says in there a quote directly from God that, that he was a man after my own heart. That would be on David's tombstone, a man after God's own heart. Is that the defining characteristic of our lives? Are we all about honoring and glorifying God? Because I'll tell you, humanity is spending all kinds of time creating stuff, but none of it matters if it's not a, a, an investment into the kingdom that God is setting up. We're working towards eternal realities. We stand on the border of eternity even today. We don't know what tomorrow holds or next week. Who knows when the next shooting will be? Mass shootings are pretty normal anymore. It's unfortunate, sad. We've got natural disasters we got health care concerns. What is your, why are you here? Why are you here? But once you figure that out, it changes your whole future. You have a purpose that's so beautiful and amazing, so brilliant. David was clear because he was connected with God. What has primacy in your life? What's first? What's most important? Where's your heart at? Are we engaging in the spiritual warfare? I've spent years in my life not engaging in God's plan for my life. If you see a car, you know it's designed to transport people. If you see a trailer on the back of a semi-truck, you know it's designed to carry cargo. If somebody has money in their wallet, you know it's a medium for commerce. If you see a spoon, you know it's designed to eat with, a pot's to cook with. If it's a mop, it's to clean with. If it's a lawnmower, it's to cut grass with. If it's duct tape, it can fix anything. <laughs> Everything is designed for a purpose. And if it's not functioning as it's designed to be purposed for, I think we would start to, we, we immediately notice it. Like, for example, what if I was to say to you that I take this podium home each night to use as a cutting board? It's a good solid surface. What would you think? I don't know what you think. 
And sometimes when I'm tired, I bring a sleeping bag and I close the lid to the grand piano and lay myself out on it. Yes, sirree. And then when I want a little private time, I get one of these earbuds, put it right here, <laughs> listen to a little music. You'd say, wait, 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 wait. None of that's designed for what you're describing, right? So why is it we can see a human being and or, or, or our life and scratch our heads and say, what in the world am I here for? What was I designed for? Why is it so hard for us to understand that God has created us to live in community with him that suffices and, and suffuses our life so that we're influencing others to want to love and know him too? Why is it so hard for us to understand that? I actually don't think it is. I think what's hard for us to do is to commit to it commit to that process and when you commit I have never met this is honest I'm honest with you on this I would not lie in this situation (laughs) 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 I, (laughs) I, I have never met somebody that was sold out for Jesus that regretted it never never Have I met them and they were like, I'm sold out for God and this is, I'm flat out, this was the wrong decision. I'm miserable here. No, 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 they do not. That's not their testimony. I want to say something and and, and close with an illustration I think is really important. Um, Jesus said, uh, greater things than, than I do, you will do. And we scratch our head at that and we wonder why. I mean, because honestly, I mean, none of us, I don't think here have raised anybody from the dead. I don't think everybody we touch is healed. I don't think we've turned water into wine. Some of you are turning wine into water, but that's another sermon for another day. Um, we, We find ourselves, we're not walking on water. We're not speaking to a storm and it stops immediately. What does he mean by that, that... Greater things you'll do than, than what I do. And I want to illustrate it with this story. I need, I need my notes on this because I'm not super familiar with it, but Haddon Robinson shares about it. And it had to do with a submarine. Uh, I, if you want to make me miserable, send me on a mission trip in a submarine. I, I am not a seaman, and I definitely would not live, be happy in a submarine. I don't know about you guys, but... Now, living under the water in in the ocean, no thank you. So this particular situation, it was, they were in uh, a submarine, a U.S. submarine in enemy waters in the Pacific, and a sailor was stricken with acute appendicitis, and there wasn't a doctor, a surgeon, for a thousand miles to help him. They're stuck in this submarine underwater, and... Uh, There was a pharmacist there named uh, Wheeler, Wheeler Lips. And the seaman's temperature went to 106 degrees. So uh, Wheeler says to him, as he's assessing the situation, I have watched doctors do it. I think I could. What do you say? (laughs) The seaman's a little like, (laughs) so you've seen somebody do it. You're a pharmacist. I'm in trouble. (laughs) Um, But he he had no choice. Uh, He knew that this was life-threatening, so he consented. They go to the wardroom. They they stretch out the patient on a table beneath a floodlight. And uh, mate, assisting officers, they're dressed in reversed pajama tops for the surgery. And uh, they mask their face with gauze. And so they did some things with the ship to keep it steady. They, the cook boiled water for sterilization. A tea strainer served as the antiseptic cone. And there was a broken-handled scalpel that was the operating instrument. They drained alcohol from the torpedoes as the antiseptic, and they bent tablespoons 
to keep the muscles open. And after cutting through the layer of muscle, uh, the pharmacist, it took him 20 minutes to find the appendix. When he finally found it, it took two and a half hours to do the surgery, and they put in some cat gut stitches. I don't know what those are. And as the last drop of ether gave out, it says that the patient was wheeled to his room, and 13 days later, he was back to work. Hallelujah. Now, here's why I'm sharing this illustration. If there was a professional surgeon on the submarine and he performed this surgery, would it be much to marvel about? No. That's, they're, they're trained, they're skilled at that. But is it something to marvel at that the pharmacist performed that surgery? Is that a greater work, would you say? So let me ask you a question. As God is winning souls for his kingdom, is it a greater work that he's doing it through you than if he was doing it in person with his expertise? Yes, absolutely. God has called you on a very special mission, and you're impacting eternity with the decisions you're making. This series is designed for us to look at primacy and what we're doing with primacy. What is most important to us, and how are we maneuvering through life so that we can be making a difference? Jesus is calling us. He, in one of his worst sermons, his best sermon actually almost cleared the room. I don't know if you know that or not, but if you read John 6 as your chapter today, it says that, uh, and in fact, one of the saddest verses in the Bible says that, in John 6, 6, 6, it says that after that, that many of his followers left him and followed him no more. And Peter said something right for a change. And he, Jesus said to the 12, will you also go away? As they're clearing out of the sanctuary, of course the sanctuary was a hill probably in Galilee. As they're walking away, leaving in the midst of his sermon about, he's talking about metaphorically about being connected to him by drinking his blood and, and eating his flesh. As they're leaving, he says to his 12 disciples, will you also go away? And Peter said, Lord, where, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. And what is it that you could share with anybody in this world that's more valuable than words of eternal life? We are on a very special mission. May we discover it together. May we live it. May we set our sail where it catches the wind even stronger. If we've never been on the boat with Christ, may we find this series helping us get on the boat for some of us, we're sailing the wrong way, and God's going to help us turn the boat so we can get back in the right direction. I hope you'll stick around for this series. I hope that Jesus will be, for you, the most important person in your life. We're going to have Tony come up and lead us out with a song, Wonderful Words of Life.